Welcome back to Think Tank. This is Global Connections. And the question we are asking is, how concerned should we be about Hezbollah? Um, how long will Hezbollah constrain its attacks? And what will it do? Remember that it is directed by Iran, as all these other non-state actor terrorist groups on all sides of Israel are doing. And for this discussion, we have Rubmati Kandakar, a, a geopolitical strategist, uh, to join us. Welcome to the show, Rubmati. Hello, Haji, and thank you for having me. I on it. Thank you very much. Well, let me let me say that the one thing I, I want to sort of uh, lay down as context is that you have to look at all the dots and connect them. And uh, I don't think uh, a lot of the media does that. And they accept um, press release disinformation from various sources. And you really have to connect the dots. You have to use critical thinking to figure out what's going on in the Middle East. So we have Hamas in Gaza. Hamas is a non-state actor, but it controls Gaza. It is the government of Gaza because Gaza is a failed state. And it in turn, that is Hamas, is in turn controlled by Iran. It is trained, directed, uh, and it is armed by Iran and coordinated with other non-state actors. So one of those other non-state actors is uh, Hezbollah, which is in Lebanon, which is another failed state controlled by non-state actor terrorists. Okay, and um, they are they are not particularly concerned about human life. Uh, and they use um, human shields pretty much the same way Hamas does. Um, okay, and then there's another one. There's, there's Yemen. Yemen, you'll have to agree, is another failed state, which is controlled by the Houthis, who are non-state actor terrorists. They're terrorist groups, and um, they, they are controlled, surprised, by Iran and armed by Iran. And, and so uh, what we have is now three of them there. And we have the same process going on in Syria, where the U.S. is fighting in Syria. Um, so, you know, this is sort of spreading out some more. And uh, Israel has to cope with the non-state actor terrorist groups who are all sworn to do two things. One is get the, get the United States out of the Middle East, throw them out and uh, uh, isolate Israel and then destroy Israel. That's what it's about for Iran. And it seems to be getting worse. Uh, and Iran wants to keep the war going for as long as possible. So it is not particularly interested in, in, in a, a positive result from any ceasefire negotiations. And maybe that explains the positions that are taken by Hamas and the others. It wants a war of attrition. It wants to push the U.S. out and isolate Israel. And it's doing that. And Israel's uh, Israel's policy is to respond, but the U.S. policy is to uh, perseverate. So the question is: the question I put to you, Rubmati, is uh, is is the U.S. doing the right thing? Is Joe Biden doing the right thing in terms of dealing, in this case, for this discussion with Hezbollah in in southern Lebanon, in all of Lebanon? Jay, uh, in our previous programs, we have discussed uh, the role of Iran in this war. And uh, now when you ask me this about Joe Biden, he's drifting from, the, uh, from his uh, policies, Jay. And when, you know, uh, like you said, the delay that is happening in this war is helping the other side uh, rather than Israel. And uh, Jay, in these three uh, movements that you mentioned, all three are pan-Islamist resistance movements, all three are uh, militant outfits which have taken out a political role to keep their relevance. And all three have a single sole mission to wipe Israel off the map. That is by, uh, that is reiterated by their master of finance, that is Iran. And uh, these three don't have the political uh, or military capability to deal with the state. So they, are, they, they deal in these poking tactics. Uh, is uh, is Hezbollah is far more powerful than Hamas, uh, and it was uh, involved in uh, rocket firing uh, against Israel from the October seventh terrorist attack on Israel. Jay. And they kept on doing this. And uh, recently, yeah, I, I, think, like, I think you should you should emphasize the, the the point that Hezbollah started 
lobbing rockets and drones into northern Israel immediately after immediately. the October 7 atrocities. They didn't wait right yes. away. Yes. Yeah, and uh, Israel doesn't is not wrong when the uh, defense minister says we will be bombing into Lebanon because they know the th threat from Lebanon is real. And uh, southern Lebanon, uh, Jay, Hezbollah uh, has this uh, uh, strategy. The modus operandi is of uh, firing rockets. And, you know, the, uh, the recent one that happened was in Kirgit, uh, Shimona, Rivasat Al Alam, and Avibiam. Uh, these cities in, uh, I don't know the pronunci uh, part of my pronunciation. But uh, these cities in Israel. So if a foreign terrorist outfit is bombing your city, don't you have the right to self-defense? Uh, these words like genocide, apartheid, all these uh, words come into play. I think the uh, uh, word that should be emphasized is the right to self-defense by the only democracy in the Middle East against a terrorist attack, which is funded by these militant outfits. Just taking on a political minuscule political role doesn't make them a political uh, entity, Jay. They do carry out uh, targeted uh, militant attacks. They do hurt civilians. They they have this, uh, uh, what is that? Their support for Hamas, Hezbollah. Hamas is um, not a secret, not a secret in the media, but it's not reported. That bit. Yeah, well, I, you know, uh, so let me, let me go back to, um, you know, Joe Biden. He he doesn't seem to be taking strong steps to support Israel. He did at first, but then you, you saw this backlash in the U.S., this anti-Semitic backlash on many, many, many American campuses. You saw, um, you know, these uh, protests and all that. Protests that favored Hamas. It was really extraordinary that all of a sudden, um, after atrocities, within days after atrocities, there were these protests involving many tens of thousands of people in the United States, and for that matter, in Britain and elsewhere in Europe. Uh, you have, on the one hand, you have the atrocities, and on the other hand, um, you have this propaganda war that you mentioned. So um, Joe Biden is swinging from one side to the other. Uh, and a couple of days ago, we had uh, Kamala Harris get up and say, well, we have to have, uh, we have, to have a peace settlement and all that. So my question to you, Rubmati, is does, in your view, does Iran want to have peace here? Or is it in Iran's interest and within its mission of not having peace? Jay, uh, the Islamic uh, uh, movement in 1979, the revolution, Islamic revolution, well, and Hezbollah's uh, genesis was in 1980, so 82. So this is not a coincidence, Jay. Iran has funded and uh, given uh, birth to Hezbollah as a uh, proxy for them. They, are, they fight the wars that Iran cannot come directly inside. Iran is too much of a coward in international politics to come head on with Israel or uh, uh, US. They want Hezbollah to do their work. And you know, when you blame in international politics, they will say, we didn't do it, Hezbollah did it. So go attack Lebanon. Uh, this is the right thing that they, uh, the tragedy that they follow. And media does not report this. Media has uh, uh, taken a narrative that uh, Israel is the oppressor rather than the oppressed. These, if you count the number of attacks, if you count the number of states which are threatening Israel every day on a daily basis, it's phenomenal, Jay, how much they have to face. Uh, and uh, Jay, uh, Hezbollah is... Uh, We'll, 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 we'll discuss the Shia Sunni uh, divide, which is a very interesting uh, point in uh, those uh, factions that they keep aside all this in, just in order to attack Israel. And Jay, what do you call a militant outfit which has the aim, sole aim, to wipe out Israel as their manifesto from the beginning? Oh, Golda uh, Meir quoted uh, famously to say that you can negotiate with somebody who is sworn to kill you. And yes. you, never get, you, you never get to the result. You never get a peace. And so, you know, and if they really wanted to have a peace, wouldn't they release the hostages? Wouldn't oh, that be, yeah. a, instead, they're killing the hostages, and the hostages are dying over, you know, 150-odd days now. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I don't think they, anyone can treat them as sincere in any effort 
um, to have to have peace. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the other thing I, I wanted to mention uh, is that um, we, and this is a part of the discussion with uh, on YouTube with uh, this fellow Amin Dean, who is yes. a former. Um, he's an, uh, a Saudi, and he's uh, he worked for Bin Laden years ago. He's very experienced in the whole Middle Eastern Islamic divide you were going to talk about. Um, and he explains what's going on here, and it has all the indications of um, a perpetual war, a war in which we have attrition. And after all, Israel is surrounded by all these people who want the river to the sea and destroy yes. Israel. And, and that means, uh, of course, uh, Hamas, the Yemenis, um, the uh, uh, Islamic Jihad, um, and uh, Hamas in, in, uh, in, uh, um, Hamas in, in uh, the West Bank, the Russians now. Uh, are in the Golden Heights. Yes. Um, who did I miss? I mean, it's just all around them, all people who want to destroy them. Isn't that nice? <clears throat> and they have invested 5% of their entire population, of their entire Israeli population is fighting. How long can they continue to do that? What kind of an economy can you have? <clears throat> and, you know, uh, for reasons that are really not clear, uh, well, that are clear, I guess, uh, is that Congress isn't giving him any money uh, and letting him wither on the vine. And so how long can Israel keep this up uh, against um, a very well-funded, well-trained, well-armed group of terrorists uh, that are in all, in all its borders? Uh, so I feel that the war of attrition doesn't, doesn't go well for Israel. Um, and, um, I, you know, I, I don't know how long they can continue to do this. They, they have a stiff upper lip. And they, they are proud and they, they are determined, but they're losing people and they're yes. spending all their money and nobody is at his desk, you know, at his job. This is, this is all citizen soldiers and they, they're not participating in the Your thoughts? You're so right about this, Jay. How long can they continue is the biggest question, you know. Ceasefires, all this is dealing tactics. And... Uh, uh, they have replenishments in uh, their uh, forces. You know, one one on one comes. They're like a pack of hyenas who are hunting, and they come one on one, one after the other, one after the other, and they are refreshed, and they are reinforced, uh, and they keep on attacking Israel. And Israel has to deal not only with these uh, follies, Jay. They have to deal with uh, international media, international pressure, and uh, Jay, like you said. The entire population is fighting. When do you concentrate about the economy? When do you concentrate about being a state? How long can they give up? And that's what uh, the courage is all about, isn't it? It's just about uh, surviving. And uh, somewhere you need divine intervention, I think, uh, which uh, they do draw their strength from. Uh, you know, I, I, I may sound, you know, it's uh, out of my uh, position to talk about this, but it's always divine help that, Israel can stand up to these nations. I don't think any other country could have withstood so much of resistance, Jay. And for so can many you imagine, years. Can you imagine what would happen in the U.S. if somebody attacked us like this? You remember 9-11, you know? And we, we, the Israelis, were attacked. We didn't start this. Um, anyway, uh, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about uh, the Lebanese border and Hezbollah in the sense that they, they do have more sophisticated weapons than Hamas. Uh, they have more, more, more soldiers than Hamas. Um, they're, they're closer, I suppose, to Iran. Um, and they have been lobbing uh, rockets and missiles uh, into northern Israel, increasing distances uh, since uh, October 7th. Um, and so uh, the Israelis are saying, well, you, you better not do that anymore. If you continue to do that, we're going to have to counterattack you. In the meantime, Israel's taken 80,000 people of uh, uh, the, the cities along the border there um, and, and evacuated them to other parts of Israel where they're living with family, friends, hotels, what have you. I mean, it's not like there's a, a place waiting to take care of them. 
they have to be yes. relocated in the evacuation. Um, and so um, when Israel says you better not do that anymore, how serious can Israel be? Because if, if Israel actually goes after them, it's going to have a big fight on its hands. Um, and um, then it'll have two fights going on uh, or more uh, or maybe three fights. Um, and can it afford to have a major fight on the border of Lebanon? So I wonder when they say you better not do that anymore, whether they're really saying we'd rather not have a major fight with you. What are your thoughts? Yeah, Jay. Trying to avoid it is, uh, the, uh, this. Uh, Jay, why, one thing about them is that uh, they, they are uh, funding and these rockets are so, uh, I, I use the word again, targeted. They, they have, Israel has got this diverse uh, aims and objectives to stop this border, to clean Gaza, to uh, protect its citizens. For them, it is just attack Israel, attack Israel, attack Israel. There is no other aim for them. And like you said, they're determined. They're determined in their, and focused. Now, uh, Hezbollah, Hezbollah uh, makes rockets in the name of Israel. I mean, they don't have stockpiling or they don't have any other mission. They don't have anything to protect their borders. It is just targeted towards uh, hammering Israel. That's the only thing, aim, sole aim for that. And Jay, a little bit of uh, background on them, that uh, Hezbollah is a Shia militant organization. Hamas is a Sunni militant organization. And Shia Sunni divide is huge in Islamic, uh, in the Islamic world. We don't know about it as much as we, we just uh, give a fleeting response to it. And Lebanon is 30%, 30% Christian, 30% Shia, and 30% Sunni. So the uh, legitimacy and the authority that uh, Hezbollah gets uh, is by showing that they are fighting Israel and they try to garner support in the uh, Shia Sunni uh, faction of Lebanese population. But they don't get that kind of support because the Shias, uh, Sunnis, don't support Hezbollah. But because Hezbollah is supporting Hamas, which is a Sunni organization, they get that support. So it is your you are your enemy, my enemy, we are friends. And maybe mm -hmm. I yeah, don't yeah. Like, uh, that kind of tactics happen in uh, this uh, these militant organizations. So they forget their uh, Islamic divides and they go forth for militant aims uh, and uh, about Israel. That, that's very, very dangerous. And Lebanon was a Christian country 30 years back. If you know. Yes, well, I mean, Israel is surrounded by failed countries. Mm. Think about it. Every single country, I, I would accept uh, Egypt from that. Um, but Egypt doesn't want the Hamas in, in its borders because it doesn't, because it treats Hamas as a terror group. Um, so, you know, every one of these terror organizations is in a failed country, meaning that the, the failed country can't doesn't have the resources, people, or political control to do anything. So you have the whole Middle East, really, run by uh, Iranian terrorists, whether they be Shia or Sunni. Um, yes. And there is, the common denominator is Iran, motivating them all to attack Israel. Um, <clears throat> so I, I guess, uh, you know, I'm, I'm worried about what position the United States can take, because somehow, see if you agree with me, Lebanon is a key feature here, because if the war on the northern border, Shuyat, Shimona, if, if they are attacked, um, and if people who have evacuated, 80,000 people have evacuated uh, to, the, to the south, and they are attacked because these, these missiles and rockets can reach over the, the, the zone of evacuation and into central Israel, if this becomes a big war, um, what happens then? And what is the United States going to do? And, and this is a silly question, but what is the United Nations going to do? How about nothing? Uh, but, you know, what, what, how does the calculus change if, if uh, Hezbollah really does attack northern Israel? Right now, they just have, have you know, these sporadic attacks with missiles and rockets, um, but they're not using the full measure of the armaments that they control. 
Um, they just want to keep Israel un off balance. That's what they're doing. And, and have this continuing threat that if it got into a real shooting war there, uh, how would that change the calculus? How would it change um, the need for American involvement? Jay, Israel's war tactics from the beginning, October 7th, terrorist attack on Israel, we saw that before anything being proved, before anything being, they continued their attack and resistance on the Hezbollah from the Lebanese front. They knew that this is the front which will keep on poking. So they knew they had to keep it on bay. And till now, they have kept them, uh, you know, they're resisting them. So uh, the, Israel is very clear about Lebanon to hold them back because they keep on poking. U.S. as an ally, as a... Uh, uh, I keep uh, we keep on talking about this that it's the hegemon of the international system, and to have a vantage point in the Middle East or to have the existence of Israel as the only uh, democratic uh, state in Middle East is of vital importance to the United States, and to keep it going to support it is not only a matter of uh, uh, military or you know uh, civilian importance; it is also a uh, humanitarian because. There are six countries who are trying to destroy a country out of the map. Uh, how long can you have that? And not only the country, that's an entire race which they want to uh, make it vanish off the map of uh, the human existence. And that cannot happen. Tomorrow they will uh, clamp down on the next target. After Israel, it will be another target. And uh, Jay, when you have this much of uh, the Islamic resistance movements, if, and God forbid, they never uh, achieve the uh, target of uh, eliminating Israel, they will be a breeding ground for more terrorism. They will start planning more uh, terrorist attacks in all the democratic states. The Sharia law, the Sunni law, the, this law, uh, uh, undermines democracy in every which state. So Israel is not only a state, it is also the beacon of democracy. And, uh, Jay, we, we lessen the value of democratic... Uh, uh, issues because um, if we don't keep Israel at the forefront, because see, um, functioning liberal state in the Middle East is a rarity. No, it's a single one. We don't have many Israels. We just have one Israel. So if you want to preserve uh, this kind of uh, uh, outlook or thought, it has to be, uh, the ally has to be in, the allies, in fact, have to be uh, in full support. And wavering support in the Congress, I think, has to be overcome. Uh, it has to be an overt policy of uh, no, supporting, not a covert one, because right now there is entire, uh, there is, uh, there's an overt attack on Israel. So it needs overt responses in every which way. And a small uh, cutting back check is very dangerous because Israel is being, uh, Ukraine is just facing Russian aggression. Let me take it, uh, if you want to compare it. Just Russian aggression on one front. Israel faces these kind of attacks on six fronts, seven fronts. And with uh, guerrilla warfare tactics, uh, which uh, just overwhelm the traditional military uh, apparatus. And uh, Jay, in that, there is a growing anti-Semitic uh, sentiment all over the world where Jews all over the world are targeted. So this is, uh, the spilling over effect is more dangerous for Israel. So this is a very complicated situation, Jay. And support from allies or non-allies is very, very uh, important. But I like one thing, that Israel is very determined in its task and it, it knows how to fight uh, without support, with support, and just for, like you always say, this line is yours, existential crisis is God. So it needs, it has to, it has no other choice. And That's, any... Let's, go ahead. Yeah, Jay. Well, let's turn to uh, the U.S. for a moment. I mean, we are now, let's see, voting begins, absentee voting, you know, begins mm. in September, some states for the November yes. election. And we're, mm, let's see, um, April, May, June, July, August, five months away from that. And um, <clears throat> maybe seven or eight months away from the election itself. 
And um, uh, it, it seems that uh, uh, Trump has said that he would like to see Biden fail. He would like to see Biden fail in everything possible. Immigration, for example, wants to see him fail there. He wants to see him fail in Ukraine so he can blame the failure of Ukraine on him. Uh, he's going to fix Ukraine, Trump says, on day one. He'll fix it by giving it to Putin. Uh, and, of course, he, he would like um, you know, this war to continue in the Middle East so that when he gets elected, he can make peace. So the, yes. the likelihood, given the fact that the, the MAGA GOP um, is effect, effectively controlling and blocking aid and a resolution of the immigration crisis on the southern border, um, it's in Trump's interest to keep everything in suspense and not to allow, not to allow Mike Johnson um, to solve any of these problems so that he, Trump, can blame the, the Democrats and Joe Biden. So I, I suggest to you that we aren't going to see uh, an American uh, initiative to help Israel, um, not, not in a major way anyway. Uh, Joe Biden may may provide them some weapons, but nothing nothing uh, as we would have in in the bill that that he submitted um, or caused to be introduced. So that if let's assume that nothing does happen, where the United States gets its act together and supports Israel the way it was supposed to. What happens politically here in this country? I mean, A, it makes Joe Biden look weak. Maybe in some ways he is. And B, it makes Trump look stronger. And that would affect the election, would it not? Your thoughts? Absolutely right, Jay. Uh, he, he plays to the drama, uh, to the team. And uh, Jay, uh, American foreign policy, irrespective of the presence, like we say, it falls in line. And Israel has always been an ally, irrespective of Republican or Democrat. Uh, but Trump will want to take the upper hand or show, showcase that he is of the upper hand. And, you know, uh, Biden's failures will be Trump's triumphs. Uh, that kind of an uh, mindset that he's got, uh, it's, I hope it does not move towards any dangerous zone for Israel. Uh, and he continues to keep the support for Israel going irrespective of national domestic politics, because this is something beyond our borders, but it will affect every Jew in uh, within uh, American borders. And uh, J, uh, election promises, election promises on Israel, uh, they are very muted about it because we know that the general sentiment amongst the people is not that well educated. They do not have a very uh, um, clear idea of what is the Israel-Palestine conflict. They see 200 protesters waving the Palestine flag. They think Israel is bad. Nobody goes into the nitty-gritties of international politics or, you know, what is happening, really happening in Israel. They go with the mob. They go with the masses. So coming out with these kind of statements pro or against Israel, they will always uh, restrain themselves, these two presidential candidates. They will keep it muted. But uh, underlying uh, current will be towards being an ally for Israel. Uh, that's what is my thought about uh, Israel. And at one point of time, Israel is still playing conventional military weapons. Israel is still valuing a civilian life. Israel is still targeting military uh, targets in uh, Lebanon, in uh, you know uh, Gaza, everything. At one point of time, they will force Israel to uh, uh, give a more sophisticated response to these mini rockets. I'm sure about that. Hope so, because what we saw in uh, the Hamas uh, attack on our October 7th is that if you you throw a swarm of of rockets and missiles and drones against Iron Dome, Iron Dome can't handle it. Yes. I don't know if Israel solved that problem. I don't know if the U.S. has provided technology to deal with the swarm problem. But we are, we are all learning, and they are learning, and, and Iran is learning. Iran makes drones. They supply the world with weapons, including drones. So I, it leaves me with two questions I want to ask you. Um, yes. The first one is, uh, 
uh, uh, Hezbollah is saying, of course, you know, you always have the risk of gross propaganda here when a terrorist organization is say, telling you something, uh, is that they're, 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 um, they're sympathetic with Hamas. And just like the Houthis, they're going to continue to attack Israel. In the case of the Houthis, uh, they're going to continue to sink ships. And they actually did sink the Ruby Mar uh, just the other day. They sank it and it cut the cable and it did terrible environmental damages. <clears throat> um, they are going to, they will stop attacking Israel if Israel agrees to a ceasefire. And of course, Israel is not going to agree to a ceasefire unless there is an agreement for a ceasefire. And of course, Iran really does control whether there is ever going to be an agreement for a ceasefire. But let's assume there is a ceasefire. Do you think that Hezbollah will stop attacking Israel? That it will no longer be a threat. <laughs> Israel, uh, uh, Hezbollah's manifesto is to uh, eliminate Israel. How will they stop? It's a, it's a truth that Israel has accepted. And uh, just see it, instead of just looking towards only Gaza and from where the attack was coming, Israel knew that the attack is also from, the threat is real from Lebanon. And so they did not leave that front. And uh, this kind of uh, alertness about Hezbollah is always, always, always very uh, necessary because there somewhere there is always in Islamophobia their loyalty is uh, very rare. Uh, they do they do uh, stab you in the back when you're not looking. There there you know there's always a rule that you always hit from the front. An enemy you should deal with the front. But Islam in Islam they do stab you in the back. That that saying came from there. The interesting question is uh, you know we always. We look forward and we want to examine whether there are variables that could come in uh, from stage right to stage left that we haven't anticipated and that would, you know, change things. And, you know, as I was asking you about, um, you know, the, the political scene, the ever-changing political scene in the U.S., you know, whether that would change things. And I suppose uh, what happens what happens in Ukraine um, could also change the, what do you want to call it, the, the global calculus, the global environment around these wars. Um, but one thing I don't understand, and I want to ask you your thoughts about it, and that is why is Russia uh, building a, a military force in the Golan Heights? What is Putin doing? Doesn't he have enough going on in Ukraine? Jay Putin has never been away from Middle East politics. We have seen his presence uh, in Syria, uh, all throughout, he has supported. He has. Uh, 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 there was one article I don't remember. It was a gift to put in on his uh, birthday, something like that. And uh, I don't. Uh, I'll, I'll send you that link if I find it. And uh, uh, Jay, Middle East politics is a big, big distraction from Putin's aggression every and each time. When there is aggression over here, you know, you have uh, uh, the planes falling and assassinations happening. You have uh, something spectacular happening in the Middle East. You have some other underhand dealings happening in Russia. So it, he uses it as his playground. And Iran has been an ally of Russia. So uh, always. So this kind of... Uh, and Iran's outlet in the Middle East, no, in the global politics are these militant outfits. Not only uh, just, they don't have an international standing if they don't support the, uh, these small, small militant outfits. Jay. So uh, Russia uh, sees this, they, they, how do you tell it? They heard uh, these uh, <laughs> outfits because nothing concrete comes for Russia. Now they have to indulge in a tremendous amount of spending. But having these groups to their advantage is always uh, beneficial for Putin because Putin's foreign policy regarding Middle East has always been to have a hold. That has been uh, his, this, they, they don't want, Israel is a stronghold ally of the US, undoubtedly. So how does Putin come in? <laughs> he can't, he can't, so he can't 
come in directly. So he supports these militant outfits. Yeah, it's like a schoolyard, a schoolyard uh, fight. You know, in one corner of the schoolyard, you see all the bullies gang up on yeah. someone. You got to get over there and join the bullies. That's what he's doing. Uh, yeah. That's my opinion. And one True. one thing that's related to that is that um, you have the EU and you have NATO. Now, Israel is not a member of NATO. Uh, wish it were. Um, but um, you know, they are focused on Ukraine. I'm, I'm not saying they're helping Ukraine. Maybe that, you know they, they should help Ukraine a lot more. Ukraine is running out of soldiers and it's running out of ammunition. It's running out of morale. Um, and that attack the other day on uh, whether it was intentional or by mistake by Russia against uh, the prime minister of Greece and Zelensky in Odessa, that was pretty threatening. So yes. um, we have Ukraine is in, you know, it's in, it's in a bad place uh, for the lack of support by the U.S. My question to you is, how much can Israel count on support from the EU? countries of the EU and, for that matter, the countries of NATO. Have they been helpful here? Would they be more helpful, you think, if there was a fighting war, I mean, a really hot war on the border with uh, Lebanon, with uh, the Israelis, the IDF, and Hezbollah? Jay, at one point of time in international politics, I always thank it that they are not that effective organizations to voice their opinion or to implement their decisions. They are just, uh, they have they have decisions which are just binding uh, the guidelines, not binding, and they don't have military prowess to enforce it because the kind of discussions that are going on in the EU uh, are, and, uh, are not uh, worthy of the Israeli uh, defense state. And uh, if you see that uh, they have a lot of uh, pressure from the internal domestic politics, the right wing, left wing is going on over there. So they have those kind of issues that come in, the EU uh, decisions that come in. And NATO uh, is a good force, but we have the hegemon supporting Israel, so that is a balancing tactic in that. But as international uh, organizations, uh, EU is false short, Jay. And Netanyahu had told a long time back that this war from Israel will move to Europe. Now, when he said that, he had a very clear-cut idea that when these immigrants go to Europe, there are actually there are already existing terror cells in Europe which watch the politics in Middle East very closely, and at will they can have these uh, hotspots in Europe which are vulnerable to uh, attack. They 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 are not going to stop, Jay, and they keep on getting stronger day by day. Tell me a European street which was the same ten years back. We used to go on holiday, we used to love it. We used to love the European culture, we used to love uh, the, the, the history behind it. And now it's defaced. There is, a, there is a total cultural invasion. I don't mind immigrants. I don't mind uh, people coming in and staying in for survival. But when you invade a, a, a place with its culture and you undermine uh, it and overwhelm it with your own, you destroy the... Uh, I. I for me, truly, personally, Europeanness is destroying and uh, destroyed at a very fast pace. Ten years well, it from also now, has an effect on the politics. You yes, know, this, this anti-Israel politics, uh, you know, from from migrants, from Islamic migrants uh, in um, in Europe, certainly has an effect on uh, elected leaders in democracies. There, don't you think? Right wing, left wing is uh, uh, is so acute, you know. Netherlands, Denmark, these places are coming out with uh, over covert uh, expressions of hatred. And Jane, right now, these terror cells regroup, come back, and they will be reinforced with these migrants who will move from uh, the Middle East towards uh, Europe. And when they have European environments, European facilities to uh, garner support or, you know, to establish their own identity over there, you think they will leave? Lebanon was a Christian country 30 years back. We can't uh, let go of that fact that it doesn't take long for them to uh, completely take over. And immigration, migration uh, for survival was a different cause 10, 20 years back. Today, mm -hmm. it is just for regrouping, reinforcing, and oppressing and taking over. 
this taking over from migrants is going to be a big problem uh, in 10 years from now. Writers about migration cannot write about anything else other than what will be. Netanyahu was perfectly right when he said that the problem moves from here to Europe. He, he gave the destination, he gave the location. Yeah. That way. Well, the U.S. has to be concerned, even if they want to be isolationists in Congress. The fact is that we could have terrorism here. Uh, you you uh, yeah. suggested that possibility before. But I want to I want to throw one last possibility at you, Lumadi, and that is this: we we've looked at all this coordination, direction, weaponizing from Iran. It's not going to stop. It's going to get worse because uh, you know what what did that fellow? Um, uh, uh, I'm, in, I'm in Dean say, he said, you, pleading with weakness will get you war, quote, in that video on YouTube. Leading with weakness will get you war. And, um, you know, I, I think this will continue and Hamas will get stronger and more bold. Um, and so will Iran. And so will all of these terrorist organizations. They are pretty bold right now. But... <clears throat> If you say that Iran is controlling Hezbollah, and if you see that uh, Hezbollah is very weaponized and has sophisticated missiles, missiles and drones that it has not used yet, has not deployed all of its weapons, it seems to me there's a possibility that Iran is holding them in reserve as yes. a strategical matter. And when the time is right, whatever you know, Hamas feels the time should be, uh, then it will unleash Hezbollah from the north onto Israel, uh, making, you know, the war a much bigger war and uh, drawing other people in or not um, and uh, developing even greater threats to Israel. Um, so my question is, do, do you feel that, I, you know, from the four corners of this conversation, I, I feel that Iran may be holding Hezbollah in reserve. Like as a military battlefield strategy to use at the at the right moment. Do you do you feel that too? Do you think so? Absolutely, absolutely right, Jay. Uh, in in our previous programs, we do have discussed this that the October seventh terrorist attack. They knew that it's not going to destroy Israel in one shot. It was targeted towards provocation, expecting a retaliation, and then a long drawn war strategy. It was just a provocative attack on Israel. They knew that they will have a retaliation. And uh, this kind of, they are thinking beyond uh, uh, us, Jay. They, they're thinking 10 steps further. And Iran, like the point that you said, Iran is holding Hezbollah in reserve is such a valid point because right now they have not shown anything. A few rockets is not what they have. The Shaheen drones uh, that is Iran supplies to the world, they can put the entire thing on Israel. So uh, these strategies are still waiting to be unraveled. And uh, uh, Israel is at a greater risk now than it was before because uh, they are just regrouping and reinforcing their uh, ammunition. And the target is getting stronger. The target is determined, but the enforcements are getting stronger and stronger by the day. Yeah, now, so when you talk about Russian presence also, it's, it's Afghanistan was just Russia and uh, uh, U.S. and Afghanistan and the local this. But this is a far more complicated situation in Israel. Israel is alone, fighting and grappling for U.S. support, ally, when you have totally, totally antagonistic uh, atmosphere surrounding it. It is encircled by this. And, Jay, constant consistency in the attacks which are against Israel, is a very uh, hard-hitting feature of this uh, struggle. They don't stop. They don't stop in the night. They don't stop in the day. They don't stop any time. So a 24 hours alertness is difficult to maintain. A, a country can maintain one line of a border or, you know, one front. But constantly having to defend your country 24-7 is a daunting task. And yeah. that kind of... It's very daunting. I mean... I don't know how much to tell it, but we don't want, I told you again and again, we don't want conferences of what was and what would have been. There has to be action and there has to be uh, decisions right now, results right now. Yeah, and, and finally, what I get out of this, I think we're out of time, but let me 
offer this thought to you is that uh, support by the U.S. and soon and right now becomes increasingly more important um, yes. to Israel, to the survival of Israel, uh, with all this encirclement you talk about. Well, thank you, Rupmati. Rupmati Kandakar, our global geopolitical strategist, really appreciates this discussion. Uh, we'll follow up because this is a moving target. I hate to use that word. Um, and uh, there's more to come. Thank you so much, Rupati. Mahalaji. Thank you so much. Aloha.